This is Friday, September 7th, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Albert Del Monte. Welcome, Al. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for coming. May I ask when you were born? I was born on June the 6th, 1934. And where were you born? Born in Newton. Pro I, I think it was St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me you were actually in the Thompsonville neighborhood. That's right. And uh, what community do you currently live now? I live in Medway. Marital status? M married for 53 years. And do you have children? Yes, we have, we have four boys and we lost one to leukemia, so we have three remaining sons. Do you have grandchildren? Two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And tell us what uh, Thompsonville was like growing up. <laughs> very Italian, okay? It was mm -hmm. very clicky. Uh, what you did in the, at nighttime, you went on the corner. Everybody stood around the drugstore. No prescriptions, but it was called a drugstore. Mm -hmm. Lionel's, okay? And, uh, from there, you uh, went to the playground to either play cards or baseball. <laughs> <laughs> you remember uh, Pearl Harbor? Oh, yeah. Tell us what that was like. I was only, uh, let me see, 41, seven at the time, so mm -hmm. I really didn't understand what it was all about other than it happened. I remember more about D Day which I was 10, mm -hmm. that was my 10th birthday, and I remember more about that, and was into the so-called Second World War at that time. But I really don't remember uh, the impact that Pearl Harbor had on me then, right. as it does now. Okay, uh, did you have any relatives in the war? Yes, I had an uncle that uh, rose to the rank of Colonel Ful Fulbert. He went in as an enlisted man and went to officer's training school. And mm -hmm. I also had another uncle that served in the uh, Big Red One in, in Italy. Pretty distinguished. Uh, what were their names? Uh, Albert Del Monte was the mm -hmm. colonel, mm -hmm. and uh, Joseph Baldizic was uh, my uncle that uh, served the Big Red One. Uh -huh. Did they both get through okay? Oh, yes. They mm -hmm. both, uh, both since deceased, but mm -hmm. not from World War II. Right. Uh, do you remember anything else about uh, growing up in that time, like rationing or? Oh, yeah. It was all about it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get a piece of meat, it was a rarity, you know, because of all the rationing. And I remember the, uh, the blackouts. Mm -hmm. I remember one night uh, we had a blackout and we turned on all the lights and we had this big Philco radio in the, in the living room. We left it on. And, the warden knocked on the door and told us either turn it off or pull the shades down because <laughs> they could, it, we could see it from the street. <laughs> but you know, there was a thing that they had during World War II, it was called Gasless Sundays. Uh, we lived on Route 9. We used to play football on Sundays out on Route 9 because there was no vehicles. Wow. Whatsoever. And that was before they expanded it too. Really? That's amazing. Really, that. Uh, I mean, you just can't really think of it that that way now. <laughs> Even if you're playing midnight on the Sunday, here comes a car zipping down. And uh, when when I was eight years old, I used to go up to uh, Woolworths, the five and ten mm -hmm. in Newton Highlands, and they used to allow me to take the booth outside on the sidewalk and sell war bonds, and they trusted me, and I used to do that every every weekend. Good for you. I look forward to it, and they look forward to me coming. Mm -hmm. What about the end of the war? What do you remember about that? I mean, you know, that's an amazing story. I was 11 years old, and I was setting pins in the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. And to make big tips, you had to take on a grudge match, and I got a grudge match, and I was in the pit, and I heard somebody holler, look out. And instead of ducking, I looked up and I got whacked in the head with a pin. And I went down and I must have blacked out. And when I woke up, I heard sirens, 
bells, horns, whistles, and I was alone. <laughs> I didn't know if I was dead and this was what heaven was like. But what had happened, they just got the word that World War II ended and everybody was out on the street and I was in the bowling alley by myself. Oh, no. <laughs> Nobody came down to me. <laughs> and then we just went around to all the celebrations. They had big bonfires and mm -hmm. I was in Buzzards Bay at the time, uh -huh. down in Cape Cod. None the worse for wear, I hope. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had big bonfires, and mm -hmm. it just went on for through most of the night. Mm -hmm. And of course, after the war, now you're you're heading into high school. Where'd you go to high school? Newton High School, class of '52, and we got our sixtieth coming up on August the twelfth. <laughs> Were you planning uh, to go to college? Did you have a planned major? No, I, when I graduated from high school, I went to work for the A&P mm -hmm. until I got drafted. And when were you drafted? I was drafted on October the 12th, 1955, I think, 54, I think mm. it was 55. Okay. No, it was 54. I'm no, 55, I'm sorry, 55. Mm -hmm. And uh, where did you enter the military? I got drafted from the city of Newton. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put you on a train, send you to the Army base in Boston. Mm -hmm. They put you on a bus and take you to Fort Dix. And you arrive at 3 o'clock in the morning and they wake you up at 5 for the first day. <laughs> So you were kind of in the army. <laughs> yes. You didn't have a, a choice, or? Um, everybody, you know, at, at that time, there was a draft. Mm -hmm. And unless you went to college and got a deferment, you got drafted. Mm -hmm. And if you went to college and got a deferment, when you get your diploma, you got drafted. <laughs> so it didn't matter. But no, yeah. So I, I knew that I was going to. And actually, I volunteered for the draft, simply that when that summer was over, mm -hmm. I went to the draft when they asked how many people they were taking in October, and they told me and what number was I. I was three out, and I said, I would like to go. I want to be out of Fort Dix before the snow flies. Mm -hmm. And so I, instead of being drafted in November, I was drafted in October. Mm -hmm. And were you married at the time? No. No. Did family or friends join the service when you did? Not that I know of. Okay. So I now know you... my brother had gone mm -hmm. two years earlier. Yeah. He went to Boston College, and as soon as he got his diploma, he got drafted. And what was your brother's name? Jo John. We called him Jack. Jack. And is he still with us? No. No. And so you're mentioning you were in Fort Disc, Disc, excuse me, Fort Dix for basic training. Tell us what that was like. It was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if anybody's never gone through basic training, you don't know what it's like. You come out of there in the best shape you've been in in a long time mm -hmm. because they really work you uh, in in all phases of army life and calisthenics and. Uh, aside from the physical training, is there anything you liked or disliked about BASIC? No, not really. You, you know, uh, everybody had to go through it. You have the force march, you have the uh, obstacle courses, and mm -hmm. you, you just do it, yeah. you know. And did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond BASIC? Yes, when I had uh, the second eight weeks, I went to uh, Fort Chaffee in Arkansas. Uh, for fire direction training, schooling. Um, we didn't, uh, our weapons were not, we carried uh, ditty bags, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, with all our materials, as opposed to the guys in infantry training with rifles and uh, mm -hmm. what have you. Did you choose fire direction? No, and it I don't even know how you. I got it. I, you know, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to get it. Uh -huh. 
And after basic, uh, where'd you go next? Straight to Korea. I got on, we, we left uh, Chaffee, got mm -hmm. on a plane to uh, Fort Lewis in uh, Seattle, Washington for embarkation to Korea. And that was it. And this was, was this Two your first weeks I spent in, in the States and the mm -hmm. rest was, <laughs> that was it. Wow. Was this your first trip overseas? Yes. What was that like for you? It was, uh, if you've ever been on a troop ship, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not a, uh, you're not on a yacht. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's uh, 12 guys in a cubicle, six and six in hammocks. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's all they are. You don't have a car, but it's just hammocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we get into southern waters, most everybody slept up on deck mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. <laughs> Where did you land in Korea? In Chon. That was an experience. Don't Tell forget, us. I grew up in a affluent city of Newton, and I never, you know, when I came up out of the hole and took one look, I, that was a scene and a smell I had never experienced. I can't even describe it. You have to, you know, you can see television or pictures about poverty mm -hmm. and everything, but unless you see it, feel it, smell it, it, it has a different impact on you, and it, it certainly had one on me. But mm -hmm. when I rotated 16 months later, mm -hmm. and I went through Incheon, they had paved roads, running water, and street lights just in 16 months after the truce. Wow. Because Enchan was uh, one of the battles in Korean right. War. And what you were seeing was, at first, were the after effects of the battle. Right. Okay, so now you're in Enchan, and you were uh, part of what unit? No unit. Repo, what they call repo depot, mm -hmm. you know until you get to a basic outfit, you, mm -hmm. and you, what, you just go through processing. Okay. And what rank were you at the time? The lowest, E1, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. Didn't have anything yet. Okay. <laughs> well, so uh, tell us what happened after. Well, you go through uh, what they call uh, processing, and uh, I guess it was about a week. And we get uh, about 12 or 15 of us on a deuce and a half. And we took off and they started mm -hmm. dropping us off at different places. And, and tell myself us and my friend, mm -hmm. who we stayed together, even through, uh, we were going to go in the same outfit. Mm -hmm. and we were the last two on the truck. And we ended up in Baker Battery. Mm -hmm. 7th Division Artillery. Now, first of all, uh, what, what is a deuce and a half? That's a nomenclature for a truck, two and a half ton truck. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. That's okay. And what was, what's the uh, friend's name? Jean Lekarczyk, L-E-K-Z-A-Y. Something or other. <laughs> we used to call it the alphabet. <laughs> CZYK, that was it. Okay. And is he still with us? That I don't know. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know he was from South Bend, Indiana, but uh, I don't know if he's still with us or not. Okay. You're now with the Baker Battery 7th Division. Tell us what happened next. Well, when we first got there, uh, we were both put in the uh, survey. Gene mm -hmm. eventually ended up as being the uh, company, uh, the battery clerk, because he mm -hmm. could type. And I stayed in survey probably no more than three months mm -hmm. till I got into fire direction. All uh, right, so uh, where were you at the time in Korea, the 7th Division? Uh, Munson, Munsonee, 
which is by the so-called railhead, mm -hmm. uh, maybe about five miles from the uh, DMC. Mm. You were pretty close then. Oh, yeah. You're now in fire direction? Was that a different location? Uh, yes, I was still in the, in the uh, same tent because mm -hmm. fire direction at the time only had an area big enough for the switchboard and the plotting boards. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, <clears throat> with the, the help of guys that were on so-called uh, battery detail, mm -hmm. they dug a hole in the side of the hill and we built a bunker. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went in the bunker. What were the physical conditions like when you were there? <laughs> Not the best, but you know, uh, we lived in squad tents, mm -hmm. and they had uh, two pot belly stoves. And they had to go out at night unless somebody stayed up and watched them, but nobody wanted to do that. So mm -hmm. you went to bed warm and you woke up cold. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't leak, thank God, thank mm -hmm. goodness. And in the summertime, you rolled the sides up and you had mosquito nets both on the outside of the squad tent and on the, over your bunk because mm -hmm. you need it, but uh, you try to make matters as, as mm -hmm. best you can. When we moved into the bunker, it was a lot different. We had the one pot belly stove, which was always on because somebody was up always on the switchboard, mm -hmm. and it was warm to the effect that we just walked around in our shorts and t-shirts. Uh, to sell space on the floor if guys wanted to sleep there because Korea was cold, mm. very cold. Mm -hmm. How cold? One night it froze the diesel on a 20 foot downflow into a 20 foot hose, about eight of it was exposed and it froze. And diesel doesn't usually freeze, does it? It froze it? that night. Wow. Overall, do you believe that the, um, your equipment, your supplies were adequate? Then, yes. Mm -hmm. I understand that uh, when the uh, police action first broke out, uh, when they reached the Yalu River in December, because MacArthur had said they were coming home by Christmas, they still had summer clothing, and they never got a, a chance to get it. But we, yeah. We had, uh, mm -hmm. warm, if you were cold, cold to the extent that uh, you were hurting, you just weren't wearing the right clothes uh, because it got bitter cold. Mm -hmm. um, what about chain of command? Did they provide adequate leadership? I felt so. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, nothing that, uh, out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. It just seemed to go pretty smooth. Okay. Any time during your time in Korea did you always felt to be in some kind of danger? When I first got there, yeah, because uh, we had what they call condition reds. Mm -hmm. uh, and that meant that there was something brewing. And that, when I first got over there, that used to happen maybe twice, three times a week. but. Towards the end when I rotated, I, I can't remember it having happened for the, maybe the last three or four months. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time, yeah, and when you're walking guard duty, we had a laundry shack that was off the base and could not be seen. So when you pull guard duties down there, um, your biggest worry is what they called the slicky boys. They wanted to steal everything you had. Mm -hmm. And they were always around, and they would do anything to get what they wanted. But other than that, no. Uh, were they South Koreans? Or South Koreans, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the locals. Right. OK. Uh, did you ever see the enemy when you were there? No. I, when I got off the boat at Incheon, 
they had a Mongolian prisoner, and he was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. And I said, I hope they exchange, keep him up. But mm -hmm. other than that, that's the only, no. Um, we got up near the parallel a few times, but uh, not in the area where the mm -hmm. North Koreans had outposts. Did you ever fire your weapon or do fire control or? No. No? No, but on the condition reds, okay, mm -hmm. we had the 155s. Those are the big guns, 155 mm -hmm. howitzers. Our guns were trained on Pam John. Mm -hmm. So if they ever, all I, they were, I gave all the commands except the elevation. The elevation means to put the projectile in the tube. Mm -hmm. Everybody standing at the, at the ready. And if I gave that command, the next one would be fire. And it would be on Pim John. Now, I don't know how many other outfits in our area, if they all had different targets, but mm -hmm. I would imagine so. Um, aside from what you term the Slicky Boys, did you ever have contact with the locals? Oh yeah, we used to go down to the village all the time. Uh -huh. And they used to come around to, to the laundry shack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, did they treat you well? Yes, they did. Uh, well, so the, uh, my la all our laundry was done by Mama Son. You threw it mm -hmm. over the fence and she would throw it back over and you'd pay a, a few, I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. Whatever the rate of exchange yeah, was. And they shine your boots and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you were a pretty good source of income for them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, during your time in Korea, did you ever uh, get leave or R&R? &R? Yes, we had, I had R&R &R twice. I went to uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. The first time I spent uh, a week in Yokohama looking up a uh, boyhood friend of mine from Cape Cod. We spent a week together, and the second time uh, we went to Tokyo, mm -hmm. and it was like a reunion. Everybody that uh, it seemed like that was on that boat took the R&R &R at that time before heading home, and so we really saw some guys we hadn't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. well, that was good. It was. And how long uh, were you in Korea overall? Sixteen months. That was the tour of duty at the time. When did you leave Korea? July 7th, 1956. Any other overall thoughts about Korea? No, it, uh, <clears throat> it was cold. Mm -hmm. I made some good friends. One that I'm still in contact with that lives in New Jersey, and we've, we've met a few times. And what's his name? Tom Sasato. We used to call him Monk. And he was in my unit. Mm -hmm. Where did you uh, embark or disembark? Embarked well, Seattle and disembarked mm -hmm. Seattle. Seattle, okay. No, I take that back. It was, uh, we came in at San Francisco, but it was Oakland, I guess. Okay. Somewhere around there. California. Right. Did you still have uh, Army time left? As I said, uh, if you, when you got back to the States, if you had less than 120 days left, you got discharged. So mm -hmm. when I got to Fort Dix, I got discharged on, I believe it was August the 1st. 1956, <clears throat> and instead of I would have had to go to October the 12th. Mm -hmm. It cost them more money to reassign you for that short period of time. And what rank were you when you e, left? Uh, E3 uh, Corporal uh, at the new rank with the call specialist, third class. Mm -hmm. After you left the Army, did you join any veterans organizations? No, I was a, uh, a member of the American Legion in Thompsonville, mm -hmm. but not as a veteran. For some reason or other, they didn't recognize me as a vet, as a, 
they changed their rules later. Mm -hmm. But when I got sick if, a couple of years after that, I uh, gave up all my uh, clubs and memberships. Mm -hmm. Because what do you do there? You drink. <laughs> I couldn't drink anymore. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Tell us what happened after you left the Army. I went back to work at the AMP full time. And after a year, I asked them about a promotion because with my time before and after, I had pretty near 10 years in, and I was only, at the time, 25. And I got a so-called runaround, so I said, Labor Day is my last day. I'm going back to school. And I went back to school. <clears throat> and where'd you go to school? I went to Newton Junior College for a year. And then I went to Syracuse for two and a half years, night courses. Were you doing this on the GI Bill? No. No. I, on the first year at the GI Bill, I was holding the uh, GI Bill because uh, after we were going to get married, mm -hmm. and we were going to go in the, so the Syracuse University had Quonset huts for veterans, mm -hmm. and we were going to go there, and then I was going to go back full time. But somebody from Newton came up and offered me a job, mm -hmm. <laughs> and before I could say yes, my wife was sitting in the back seat of the car with the baby. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, Syracuse wasn't her cup of tea. A lot of snow. A lot of snow. Um, and what was your major uh, when you were in Syracuse? I was taking business. Okay. Wife, baby, back of the car. You're heading back to Newton? <laughs> <laughs> back to Newton. So tell us what Newton was like in the 1950s. It was a great place. Mm -hmm. uh, it was getting expensive, and as the family got bigger, I needed a bigger house and couldn't afford one mm -hmm. in Newton, so... We came to Natick in 1969. What part of Natick did you settle? Beacon Street. We had a 14-room house. <laughs> Tell us what Natick was like in the 60s. Well, it took me a while to get acclimated, uh, you know, not knowing anybody. It was funny because the uh, very first year we walked down the street to watch the 4th of July parade. My wife, and my youngest son, Albie, Albert, they mm -hmm. called Albie. As we were walking down the Beacon Street to Grove Street, everybody was saying, hi, Albie, hi, Albie. Everybody knew Albie. And uh, I watched the 4th of July parade. I was quite impressed. And when I went to work for Roach Brothers in 1974, and we were in the parade that year, we had a baby carriage with one of the part-time employees in there and with a sign that said, new kids on the block. <laughs> I, and we were all dressed as clowns. I got bitten and I joined the 4th of July committee, which I stayed on mm -hmm. until I moved to Medway, which was mm -hmm. a year ago. It was a long time. Mm. But these days, quite a few Natick residents know you, and not just Albie, because you I were know. also a very active in broadcasting. Right. Tell uh, us about that. Well, it, you know, it was, uh, when Natick Cable came to town, and it was Natick Cable at the time, mm -hmm. I had sent a resume, and they said that we were all set, and so on and so forth. So one day, Joe Giuliani, Bob Lesniak, and myself, with Bob Lesniak's wife, uh, Mary Ann, mm -hmm. with a video cam, we did a pilot for Let's Talk Sports, and we gave it to Cable, and they liked it. And we started Let's Talk Sports in 91, and it's still going with mm -hmm. Peter Mundy as the host now. I turned it over to Peter when I moved to Medway. Mm -hmm. But we went weekly at that time. And it's strange because the first show that went on the air, I was not there. I was in the hospital having 
a liver transplant. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, the first three were Dave Goldman, Bob Lesiak, and Joe Giuliani. And I joined them probably in March. Mm -hmm. Joe stepped aside, and then we went weekly mm -hmm. for about three or four years. Now, when, um, while well, you guys were growing up in Natty, did your children ever um, consider joining the military? Did they take? No. 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 I spoke to them about it. They had no, mm -hmm. no gumption. A couple of their friends, my oldest boy, a couple of his friends did. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about the others, if they had any friends in the service or not, but mm -hmm. that's something that uh, is not common with uh, that group or even the group now. Mm -hmm. And overall, what do you think about your Army experience? Uh, did it change your life for the better, change your life, period? Yeah. you. One thing the Army will teach you is discipline, mm -hmm. okay, and respect. Respect for everything, okay, uh, how the other half of you. You know, you get in the barracks with 120 guys for the first time, and you realize there's other people in the world besides your small community, mm -hmm. and you got to learn to get along. And, uh, no, I do. Would I have uh, stayed on? Maybe. You know, I thought about it. Mm -hmm. It was just a passing thought. I remember uh, when I was rotating from Korea, my commanding officer, Captain King, who was a West Pointer, by the way, gave me the sales pitch. And I told him, I said, if you can guarantee me that I can get what I want and stay with you, I would do it in a heartbeat, but you can't do that. This is the army. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave. Mm -hmm. And I did. Al, is there anything else you'd like to say before uh, we close out this interview? No, it, you know, my uh, fire direction, my duties were, were uh, pretty extreme. Uh, I gave the all the commands mm -hmm. to the gun. You know, I, you asked if I fired a weapon. No, I never fired a weapon. But when I gave the command, fire mm -hmm. to a 155 howitzer, I got a rush. You can imagine. <laughs> I mean, that thing's going to go out 12 miles. And if everything went right and you calculate it, you're going to hit your target. Mm -hmm. And when the FO comes back and said, mission complete, mm -hmm. you felt good. Yeah. yeah, and uh, how did I get in fire direction? I have no idea. You know, when you first, at that time, and I don't know what the Army's like now, you take a battery of tests. Did those tests show something? I don't know. Mm -hmm. My brother, who was a college graduate, I'm sure took the same test, and he ended up in the infantry. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was... It was, a, it was a good experience, and I had, uh, there was eight guys in the unit that were under me, and discipline and all that, and I, I was cleared for top secret, had to be, and like I said, our guns were trained on Pam John, and they had to, you know, I had codes that I had to uh, learn and pass on, and so it was, quite a few responsibilities, and yeah, and I, I liked it very much. Okay. Well, Al DeMonte, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank okay. you. Thank you.